farmers need coaches too. And somebody that I have grown to respect and appreciate tremendously is Charlotte Smith. She is one of the farmers that has taken retail and marketing into a service to help other farmers create a more successful business. And she shares so many tips because we need our farmers and we need them to be successful. Charlotte, uh, thank you for coming on and visiting. I think that you have put out such incredible uh, content and services and helping farmers be profitable. And I think it's such an important conversation to have and share. Uh, we cover a lot of the health, uh, you know, my son having cancer, that's a big focus. But as I dove in to, you know, why causes, how we prevent and overcome it, you know, so much of it goes back to our food and having these uh, healthy localized systems. And so what you do is crucial. And so if you will, just give us that, uh, you know, that intro to how you got into the ag world and then becoming that marketing retail specialist. Oh, well, thanks for having me first, Logan. I really appreciate it. Uh, my I, my passion is in life is to let every farmer know they can build a profitable farm. It's a set of learned skills. And like you and I were chatting before you started recording, it's crucial we get farmers profitable. So boy, how I came to it's a big question. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it as short as possible. And you can ask more later if you want. I grew up on a farm. Uh, just up the road from where I live now. And in 1980, my dad's farm went bankrupt and it was a very long four-year process of losing everything, including our house and all that. And I actually was thought farming was a ridiculous way to try to make money. And I was going to leave the farm and go to college, which I did, and get a big corporate job, which I did, and never come back. But then I got the bug when my kids were in grade school and I was living in the suburbs and I wanted them to have this lifestyle that I grew up with, with, you know, riding motorcycles, riding horses, collecting eggs. So 20 years ago, I bought my own farm just up the road from where I grew up so that my kids could be around their grandparents. And I then started a raw milk dairy because as you know, real food heals. And I wanted fresh raw milk for my kids, for our health. We had so many healing stories from that in our family and I wanted to share it with others. So I started my farm, but I brought with me my skills, my communication skills and marketing skills from my corporate jobs that I'd had. And I just started marketing my farm the same way, thinking nothing of it. And then other farmers were saying, how is it you're able to sell all your products at twice what we can sell them? And we can't even sell half of what we produce. And you have a waiting list. And so I started teaching farmers in 2012, 2013. I'd started having them to my house and teaching them marketing. And then in about 2014, it was that when there were 55 people squeezed into my living room and I'm teaching marketing and they're from four states, I thought I got to change something and uh, put it, I had figured out how to create an online course and I've been teaching online ever since. And now I have farmers in, gosh, probably 15 different countries in my program because marketing and building a profitable farm through selling direct to consumer is the same set of skills no matter where you live in the world so th that's that's it and now my message is getting out to everyone i've got over 300 farmers go through my program every year and are retiring from their day jobs they're finally making money they're able to take vacations and so many more things so so that's kind of my journey in a nutshell. And I love getting this message out there. 
That's that's beautiful. So let's talk about that adversity that you brought up there at the beginning, because, you know, one of my favorite quotes is uh, Napoleon Hill is uh, with every adversity comes the seed of an equal or greater opportunity. So what did you learn from the adversity of seeing your your parents struggle in the farm not working out? Um, where What did you what did you get from that? Oh, my gosh, I got so much. And the lessons I got from it did not come till maybe 20 years later. You know, this is a little life advice. Like I was uh, embarrassed and and bitter for for many years. I let that like how, you know, because we didn't have food. Like we ate rice and beans and we only ate meat if my dad could hunt it or catch it in the river. And so I was bitter for a long time. And then I started when I started working through that, I realized that I have the uh, belief that has served me well that I can lose everything and know how to make money and know how to survive. Even today, to this day, like if if I lost everything tomorrow, I'd be fine. I have my mindset is like I always know how to go out and get a job because we literally had nothing. We got the we left with the clothes on our back. We lost our house. We lost everything. I can make money. I can go out and do anything. I can work at Starbucks. I can milk a cow. There is, I have zero fear of losing everything anymore. And I tell you, that is such a burden lifted to not feel this pressure to have to make money or I have to keep what I have. It, I have, it, it's kind of like this idea that I'm not attached to anything. I can lose everything and be okay. And I see other people struggle with that, like their fear of losing anything, a fear of not having a job anymore. Well, that's probably the biggest lesson I learned from it all is I can lose everything and I can go start making money again tomorrow, doing a whole lot of things, driving school bus if I have to. I can drive a tractor, (laughs) any of it. Wonderful. So how did you get to that point with, with mindset? What, uh, what were those, those phases that you went through to go from what we, we can fall into those, those victim traps, right? Or be the victor. So how did you, you get to that point? Because that's not, that's not necessarily something that we can just flip a switch and, uh, and here we are, we're going to fight and we can, we can get to having a productive mindset. Right. Yes. Some, Shifts can happen like you flip a switch, almost like, oh, right. You can have a perspective shift immediately. So what I started noticing uh, in my own life, it was because of my relationship struggles later in life, you know, going through a divorce and realizing what was my role in that. And probably that was where I first started with shifting my own mindset and realizing oh, I can get help from someone. I can learn something that changes everything in my life just because my perspective shifted. So then I'm teaching marketing 10 years ago and eight years ago, and I noticed that a certain percentage of my students, the the farmers, would embrace it and have success with it. And then someone who looked exactly like them would not have success with it. And I started noticing the difference. The only difference was how they were thinking about it. And so I, it was anecdotal for me that I saw, oh, these farmers who believe they can build a profitable farm and they believe that they can learn the skills and they are open to learning something new are having great success. Other farmers who say, oh, it won't work for me. I don't live in the right area. I don't have the right website. I don't have enough money. I am too old. I'm too young. I'm too this. I'm too that. I'm a woman. I can't do it. I realized that the only difference was their mindset. Now, mindset, some people are don't even know, realize that a mindset is just a thought. If your thought is, it's really hard to make money on a farm, you will struggle to make money on your farm. If your thought is, the opposite, I'm going to learn how to make money on my farm. You will make money on your farm. So that's where it, it's that simple. And so then I started incorporating mindset coaching 
and I'm a trained, certified mindset coach as well. So when I started incorporating that into my marketing instruction, now everybody has the opportunity to be successful and make money and know how to do it. Now, there's always people who are like, okay, that's really hard because the hardest thing you will do is shift your belief. Shifting your belief from you can't make money on a farm to I am learning to make money on a farm sounds really simple, but it's the hardest thing you'll do because you're rewiring your brain. You're creating new neural pathways. That's hard work. That's yeah, that's that Charlotte, that's really profound. Just uh, to go into that a little more. I think that what you just said is exactly what, you know, Norman Vincent Peale's book, The Power of Positive Thinking is. It's it's all the the foundation behind that. And uh, it's super profound. So what what is marketing? What what in your words, what's like that definition? What is that those activities that make up marketing? I love this question. To me, it's very simple. Marketing is serving, period. And that is the mindset or the belief that I encourage farmers to come from because many of them think marketing is salesy, spammy, sleazy, yucky, icky, pushy. Those are often the words farmers come to me. Like marketing is so fill in the blank with any one of those words. And when I help them shift their mindset to marketing is serving, it changes everything. So you have a product. It doesn't matter what it is. Beef, chicken, pork, vegetables, wine, milk, eggs, fiber products from your alpaca, sheep. Whatever you have is, is helping people improve their lives somehow. It's helping them solve a problem or reach a goal. So as soon as farmers can sh shift to, I have a product people want and need and are looking for, and it's making their lives better. And it's my obligation to get my product in front of them in the way, you know, in, in the way that I can learn and I am serving them, it changes everything. So it's just that simple. Beautiful. You you articulated that better than I ever had, and that have, and that's what uh, <laughs> that's the core of it. You are spot on, and I could not agree more. I think that that's exactly why we have had the success with me and McGee Market that we have is verbatim what you just said. So that that's incredible. What is that biggest challenge that you have found with with farmers taking taking on that step? Um, because you know. Some of us, like for me, I, I grew up without, without money. And so we can get in that trap of money's bad, money we shouldn't make money or we don't deserve to make money or wh whatever that mindset is. So how do how do we overcome the money is bad and may, we as, you know, fill in the blank farmers don't deserve to make money? Huh, again, a, a big question with lots of... Um, subtleties to it. But the very first one is the mindset that m money is, what if the opposite is true? What if money is so good and it's the way you can help so many more people? If you believe money is bad, you will create, you won't market your products. You will go out of business and you will leave a community of people hanging desperate for what you have. And you did not handle your business responsibly by, I look at it as it's, it's your responsibility to shift your beliefs about money so that you can be in business a year and two and five and 10 down the road to help this community of people that so desperately wants your products to either, you know, reach a goal or, or solve a problem. So I just look at it as, yeah, we've, we've been raised with that many of us for many, many decades and especially if we were raised with religion, that money is evil and all forms of that, but it's our obligation. And I have the skills and resources to help you help farmers shift that mindset to it's your obligation to believe that money is how you can help the world. It's what we've agreed upon in our society. One, one way that I do have to offer is to shift your mindset on that is pretend that we dealt our commerce was apples instead of money. And if you said, Hey, Charlotte, 
I'll, you, you have this, uh, you know, grass fed beef. I want some, I'll give you a box of 25 pounds of apples. I'd be like, Oh, cool. I'll take your apples for beef. And neither of us feel icky or evil about that. Right. Or if you have 25 pounds of apples and your neighbor has 25,000 pounds of apples, you don't feel icky about that either. But as soon as we turn that to money, people are like competitive and jealous and thinking they're evil. And we ascribe all this meaning to it. Whereas if what I do is help my farmers in my program neutralize money, it's a tool. It's a tool. Just like if if you have a, an electrical problem, I can go in my toolbox and get some things and help you fix your electrical problem. Money is a tool that we can go in our box, our toolbox. We can pull out some money and fix other problems in the world and help our clients. So that's that's really what it comes back to is if we can neutralize it, which is very difficult because of our lifetime of programming of beliefs. So that, again, is a 180 degree mindset shift for many people. Amazing. Yep. I think that's, uh, that's beautiful. So let's, let's get into the, that, uh, that service that you're talking about, because when we look at health or we look at local economies, like our frontline workers, our frontline providers are our farmers. I think that it is vitally important and we're losing them at a terrifying rate. Right? So we're getting older. That generation is, is going away. The newer generation is like, I don't, I don't want to struggle. I don't want to enjoy, not enjoy what I do or, and be profitable. So what, what do you do for uh, relaying that importance? How do you view that? Because I think that that part of, part of maybe what fuels you is seeing the strengthening of economies, seeing the strengthening of people's lives by that fundamental level. Right. If, uh, and, and you're so right that our farmers are aging. And part of that is when our kids look at our lifestyle, if we have not done the work to build a profitable farm, they look at our lifestyle of working 18 hour days, not having enough money to do anything, struggling. And they think, well, why would I want to take over the family farm? But if I can teach the parents and a lot of my, the farmers in my program are wanting to pass on their legacy. They want to create a profitable farm so that their kids will be attracted to do that. Uh, again, that it's a, it's a mindset shift. Like why would our, why would young people want to take over something that's a million dollars in debt to start with? You know, let's at least start from a level playing field and never be able to take your family on vacation. So I just love the, I, that I can show farmers that there's hope possible. There's a different way. They can learn to get over their beliefs that have held them back about money and making money. And they can learn, you know, the other part of this is if you're selling direct to consumer, which is what you and I are in the business of doing, our products have to be more money than the grocery store because there's no economy of scale on our farms. You know, we don't have 10,000 cows usually or 50,000 cows or, you know, these huge industrial farms. We aren't the three, four big meat companies in the United States. We're f small family farms with no economy of scale. So now all of a sudden you have to double up on that mindset work because you're, it's going to cue the guilt that you have to charge more than the grocery store for most people. And again, that's a learned skill. It's a learned skill to retrain your brain that, yeah, I have to charge more than the grocery store in order to be here two, five, 10 years from now. And that's okay. People will pay that. People will value food from our farms for all the reasons you and I know, you know, health, it's much healthier. It tastes better it's more sustainable, it's supporting local commerce, all the reasons, and they're willing to pay more for that artisan handcrafted food when you learn the skills of marketing and, and showing them the value in that. 
So recently we talked to Joel Salatin and is talking about the the homesteading tsunami that's happening and how we're going into this. How do we create this reliance on ourselves, the self-reliance to where we produce our own food and things? And I feel like a lot of the uh, homesteaders kind of get to the point to where they can potentially uh, create the farm store, the farm that is profitable to where they can do this homesteading and also have have a commerce, have a business to go with it. So what what would you uh, coach? How what are those fundamental steps as as you go from, say, let's say homestead to starting a farm stand? Mm hmm. With, that is the natural progression for a lot of people. They get a backyard cow and they realize it produces 10 times more than their family can <laughs> consume or they get. 10 chickens and they realize they have dozens more eggs than they can consume or same with flowers or vegetables, whatever it might be. And so then they often give away a lot. That's, that's the next step is they're giving a lot away. And then they realize, well, shoot, if I would charge a little bit, then it would cover the cost of my seeds. And then eventually my family's eating for free. That's great. So that's kind of the progression. And then Starting a farm stand, it many people start with like something at the end of the driveway, you know, a cooler. And many people often realize quickly that the money's going to be stolen, the product is going to be stolen. So the the thing I teach, the very foundation of your marketing is get all your people on an email list, not social media. You can't reach everyone there. Just put all your neighbors, your friends and family on a little email list. Decide when you're going to be at your farm, like a two hour period. You want to funnel people into a time window, not just be open, self-serve all the time. And there's reasons behind that. Many, many reasons. So just send out an email on Friday that says, hey, tomorrow from 10 to noon, pull in the driveway at the house. We're going to have eggs for sale or eggs and milk or vegetables, or we have a surplus of tomatoes this week or dahlias, peonies, whatever it is. And let your friends and family know by email. And the next day you will have them all there and you will charge what you can. You'll, you'll learn over time how to charge enough. And that's where I would suggest you start. It's kind of the opposite of what most people do. They often will just have product available all the time at the end of a driveway or in a farm stand somewhere, and they wonder why nobody comes. So that's what I would suggest. And it works really slick to have everybody come at a designated time and pick up their things. You're creating your own little market that way, too. And the the almost unintended uh, aspect that comes with that is you're building community because you're going to see your friends and neighbors seeing each other. It's a place to where you might run into a cousin or somebody you've not seen you went to high school with or whatever. And that just creates an environment that is different than running in to get a uh, big box store uh, things, right? Because typically you're in a hurry. Yeah. This way you're able to develop relationships and and, and and those relationships matter a lot. So we we actually started by accident, my grandparents, because people would drive by and see their garden and they would pull in and say, hey, can we get some stuff? Because we're, we're outside of Little Rock, out a, a metropolitan area. And then my mom's like, y'all just build a little little stand and sell what, what y'all have. And so that progressed on to where we started bringing in other people's products or, or they did. And so we're, we've gone from basically a home garden to a farm stand to a full on grocery store uh, over over the course of 13 years. But the, those changes can can develop and be so they're so multifaceted, but there are also so many options. So you, I like how, you know, something else Joel said is this collaboration where you're building this economy by being able to partner with somebody else doing something, say salsa or breads or whatever. And the ones that kind of take on that marketing and retail passion and focus on it can then help so many other artisans and producers. So where, where can we continue to learn and strengthen those those principles email sounds like a great great option that's something i was super reluctant to do for a long time but it's a it, it's a game changer so what what do you say to those when you grow to the point to where you're doing more than just what you produce mhm mm yeah you mean uh specifically i want to 
answer the question you're asking. You mean how to bring in more people that you can sell their products, how to expand your offerings or how to bring in more customers? Yeah. What, what have you seen for, well, I, it's kind of both, right? Like if you don't sell somebody else's products, if you don't have the customers. So how have you seen the successful template, so to speak, on going from that farm stand to expanding outside of just yourself? Gotcha. If, uh, people who know me know that I preach email marketing. It's withstood the test of time. If someone is hesitant to do email marketing, it's 144 times more profitable than social media or any other type of marketing. Social media marketing won't work without email marketing as your foundation. So you just start building that email list. And I teach my clients to get something on their website and their websites can be homemade. They don't have to be, be fancy. But something on your website for them to get on your email list, like a free recipe book, or if you're selling flowers, six tips, a checklist, checklist for, to keep your fresh cut flowers lasting longer, something like that, so that people in your community land on your website, they see this free gift, and they're willing to trade their email for it, and then you can keep in touch with them. People will only show up at your farm stand in that beautiful community you've built if you're in consistent communication with them, reminding them you're out there. So I teach people that build your email list. It starts, everybody starts with zero. And, and usually the first people on your list are your mom, your sister, maybe your adult kids, if you're like me, <laughs> your, your family, and it gradually expands from there. Everybody starts at zero. And just keep building it. Also, remember, you're in it for the long game. There is no magic pill. There's no quick fix. You can't, if you buy an email list, you're just, it's going to fail. You're a commodity in that case. But this community you're building of people who come to your farm and they see other like-minded people, the community makes it valuable, so valuable to them that they're willing to pay more than the grocery store. And then they tell their friends. So every new person that you meet, you get them on your email list. That's your priority. They, a person on your email list will be a customer for years. But if you just make a one-off sale, like someone randomly drives by your store, they stop in, they buy a jar of honey, and then they leave and you don't get their email, they will most likely never be back. So you're leaving lots of money on the table. And what I mean by money, again, is that neutral. It's a tool that we can use to change the world with our farms if we can make money. You're leaving money on the table if you don't get their email. So I will preach that till something, you know, if there's something else that ever uh, evolves or shows up that is more powerful than email marketing, I'll teach that. But Right now, that has withstood the test of time. So that's the way to do it. You just email your people. If you're open on a Saturday, you email them on Friday and let them know, be here tomorrow. We got a fresh, you know, the eggs, the chickens are really producing this time of year. We got lots of eggs or uh, we just got a fresh batch of grass-fed beef or the first tulips are in the store. Be sure to be here tomorrow. So you just let your customers know every single week that you are open and available to serve them and you will just continue building and growing from that. Wonder, wonderful recommendation and strategy. I think you're, you're spot on again. I knew this is why I wanted to visit with you because there was going to be a wealth of uh, information and knowledge to share. So on, on the side of marketing and uh, awareness. So, you know, it's, it's how do we, educate potential customers on on what's going on without say preaching or being divisive or how do we do the creating awareness in a way that's positive and it, it still markets mm -hmm. what kind of awareness you mean that so let's say uh for it for your wheelhouse let's say raw milk how do we have the raw milk conversation because i don't know if you've ever seen a raw milk post on social media it can get pretty ugly right and so mm -hmm. whether whether it's uh you you would think it was politics or religion or something when we're talking about you know raw milk so how how can we do this in a way that is still 
the the net result is positive. Yeah, the absolute best way I have found, and again, this is years of working with thousands of farmers now, is to not educate through research and data and analysis and uh, educational articles, but share and educate through your customer stories. So uh, I, because I started with raw milk, a lot of it is the healing powers of raw milk, which are studied. You know, you, you mentioned it's like almost religious or something, but raw milk is one of the most politicized foods in our country. They use it to, to control us. So that, that's a whole separate thing. I don't want to get into that. So there are lots of research studies on it done outside this country because uh, that that um, show that it helps with allergies, asthma, and eczema in kids. So then when you have a customer at your store, and the same could be said for if you're selling grass-fed, pastured meat products and your customers are making bone broth from it, or they're using your pastured eggs and all of a sudden their skin issues start to heal. So it can be all the foods, but when you share specific customer stories, like, hey, uh, Emily started shopping with us and then she noticed that she her eczema subsided and then pretty soon, instead of taking one pill a day, she's taking one pill a week and now she's not on her medications anymore. All after she switched to farm fresh food. Those anecdotal stories go further and make sure they're true. You know, I would always interview my customers. I would have them on camera. This is, you know, 10 years ago, camera quality was a lot different. And I just set up the video camera there and I would have them share their story of how our farm fresh products have changed their life. And then I would in turn share that to other people. That is far more powerful than any sort of educational post on social media that's going to get some scathing comments on there too. (laughs) And that's scary. That scares people away. But when they see real people that look just like them out purchasing fresh farm, fresh food and experiencing changes in their life, that's all the evidence they need. That's, that's wonderful. All right, Charlotte, can you go into maybe an example of somebody that you've coached, you've worked with that has grown their business, developed their business and, and share the little, uh, you know, communal impact it's had maybe, you know, on that family or on, uh, the community at large, uh, whether, wherever that is. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. So many. So let's start with one of, one of my clients who, She's probably worked with me now for six years and she has become an example of what's possible in my community. She's on my podcast, you know, a few different interviews where when she, and and she was self-admittedly not open to coaching five or six years ago because of the way she was raised, she doubted it would work for her. But yet, you know, she trusted me. So she started opening up over time. And every goal that we have set through coaching, me coaching her, every goal she set, she has achieved, including she had this dream a few years ago. Her husband got in an accident at work and he didn't like his job. And she had a dream of using her farm to retire him from his day job so he could be home helping her and participating, partaking in growing and expanding the farm. That happened. Um, She is publishing her first book. They wanted to start a seed company. They did that. So she's an example of when you open up that, because a lot of people aren't even of the mindset that their mindset is what's holding them back. If you can just open up to that shift first anything is possible. So that's one person she's and and paid off their mortgage. All those things. Her is it's just ongoing. I have another client. She owns a cattle ranch in Hawaii. Same story. She now retired herself from any other work and is running their cattle ranch full time. She retired her brother from his day job so he could be home. And the ranch is supporting these families. Not only that, how coaching helps them is 
many farmers just accept that stress and anxiety are part of farming and lack of sleep and all and struggle and all those things. So my farmers not only make money and have all these financial achievements, but they're also living calmer, more balanced lives than they've ever lived before. They're taking more vacations than they've ever taken before. Um, and I, so those are two people I just interviewed. She's coming out on the podcast next week. She's in, um, Alabama, same story. She has a business agriculture degree and she found herself in a cubicle working for a cotton company thinking, this is not what I had in mind when I got my degree. So she started her farm and it was a hamster wheel of struggle. And then she found my program about a year ago and she's making 30% more money and calm and balance in her life. So the stories go on and on and on. And then other people in my pro, the reason I love having all these farmers together in one place in my program is they see each other th attain these results and they think, whoa, sh if she can calm down her life and she's no longer on anti-anxiety medications and she's still managing her farm, there's hope for me too. Or, wow, they paid off their mortgage. I didn't know that was even possible for a farmer to pay off their mortgage. There's hope for me too. So I just see people achieve results and then other people, other farmers achieve them faster and faster. It's, it's beautiful. Look, I I am curious as to how you coach through setting goals and making those goals attainable. What are what are your steps or or guidance along the lines of creating goals and achieving them? Oh, what a fantastic question. One of my favorites. I'm right in the middle of teaching a goal setting sprint. I do these 90 day goal setting goal achieving sprints in my program where for 12 weeks we um so let's see, let, let me see if I can give you some very tangible things. It has to be very clear. Most people set a goal and I can't understand it. If, if you say what your goal is to someone else and it's not clear to them, it's not clear enough. It has to be very clear and straightforward. And the problem most people make is their goal is too big and too most multifaceted. Like if your goal is maybe you made 20,000 in sales on your farm last year and your goal is to make $50,000 in sales on your farm this year. Usually that's too big. You, you know, setting a year long goal is too big. We need to break it up to, okay, let's hold space for $50,000 at the end of the year. But what can you do in 90 days? So I like to do goal setting in 90 day sprints because we can suck it up. We can use our uh, energy and motivation and even a little willpower in there. And we can say no to all other distractions and work really hard for 90 days and achieve more than we achieved all last year. And then give ourselves a break. Again, we need that mindset break, knowing that, okay, in 90 days, I'm going to have a week where I can just catch up on Netflix if I want, because I am sucking it up now and working hard. So that's the big thing. Let's get choose a goal that's very clear that you know is attainable by you in 90 days not reliant on other people or other things but for instance maybe you want to build a barn in 90 days but you don't have the money well then building a barn in 90 days is not the goal the goal is how much money do you need to raise and how are you going to do that so maybe the goal is applying for a grant. And these are real life examples from people in my program right now. She wanted to have the barn built. And it turns out if you don't have the money, you need funding first. So her goal is to have five loan applications out in the next three weeks and finish all the requirements for a grant she's been trying to apply for for months. But, you know, that can be tedious. So, so we've broken that all down into steps that she will complete in two hour time blocks, three days a week. So that's it. You take your big goal and you break it down. What do you want to see at the end of 90 days that is completely attainable by you? And then break it down further into two hour time blocks every week until you get there. You might have two week check-ins to make sure you're on track. So that's what I do. I take people's big goals and we make them step by step and it and it is guaranteed. There is nobody not going to reach my 
their goal in my goal setting, achieving sprint because of that procedure we use. So hopefully some of that is helpful in there. <laughs> no, it makes perfect sense. I think that's uh, wonderful as well. So where, where have you seen the mentorship help? Why is it so important that we, I guess in any field or any, any cause that we have in life, why is mentorship or coaching so important? I think having the example, it, it goes back to that four minute mile. We, nobody believed you could do the four minute mile until you, maybe, you know, the name of the person who did that. I can never remember the name until they did the four minute mile. And then it was many, many other people in succession achieved that right afterward, because we have that example of what's possible. When you have a mentorship, when you have a mentor that you trust, who trusts you to listen to them. And I think that's important that the mentor needs to know that you are open to uh, hearing what they have to say. You have this example of something that you never thought possible before. So that's why it's so crucial is it can show us that, oh, you can be a farmer and pay off your mortgage. You can be a farmer and go camping three times in the summer, in the middle of the busy season. So that's where I've seen it is it just makes it makes the mentee achieve goals, number one, they never thought possible, and number two, in a faster time frame than they ever could have experienced. So wonderful. So how, uh, how would somebody find where, where your work is located? Let's get, uh, get all the information out there and what kind of products and services are you doing that, uh, can really transform somebody's business? Mm -hmm. My website is charlottemsmith.com. And on my website, you'll see one of the uh, little tabs is uh, the podcast and it's profitable mindset podcast. And that's on all the podcast platforms out there. You can listen to that. And I'm on Instagram, charlotte.m.smith. And of course, Facebook. And I teach one program and it's called five X your farm sales. And, uh, it includes this really amazing planner, this farm theme planner, which my clients learn to use. It's a one-year program. They work with me for a year. They have this planner. They learn to manage their time and calm down their lives. Once you calm down your life, then we focus on making money. If you try to make money before you've created some calm and balance, money will be a struggle and it won't it, there won't be any left. Maybe you still make sales, but you're wondering why your bank account is empty. So that's what we do. We spend a year because we have spent, each of us, no matter how old we are listening to the podcast, has spent a lifetime ingrained in the beliefs we have right now that keep us overworking and not making money. So my program's a year because we need a year for you to dive in, retrain your brain, to have a growth mindset, you know, create success and profitability in your life, retrain your beliefs and all that. So that's what I do. You, you can find me those places. I have one class I teach and you can hear all sorts of success examples on my podcast. There's so much free learning on my podcast too. So many, like um, uh, next week, the episode is all about uh, how I do deliveries and drop sites step by step. So there's marketing stuff, there's business stuff, and there's mindset stuff. I think it's a, a really great balance of what I needed when I started out 15 years ago on my farm. And uh, so that's that's where I am. Charlotte, thank you. Thank you for the time. I think this is such an important conversation. It's uh, such an important service. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of work to do to get the, you know, education for just the general, uh, you know, public, just consumers to do, but we've also got to have that the source of production and that's got to be profitable. So we got to, you know, it is super multifaceted in the, the overall mission, but uh, what you're doing is incredible. And uh, I cannot thank you enough for spending the time and laying out these beautiful, beautiful lessons. Thank you so much for having me, Logan. This has been great. It's wonderful to meet you. Bye.
supplies. Thank you for joining us on Sewing Prosperity. Be sure to follow along across the social media platforms, including YouTube, and be sure to go to sewingprosperity.com.